good.
Welcome to the Marsh webinar. We'll be starting shortly. Once again, a very warm welcome to all of you for the Marsh webinar on managing supply chain risks and the credit demand conundrum. I'm Sanjay Kedia, country head and CEO for Marsh India. Let's move the slides. All of you have an opportunity to raise a question uh, at any point of time. You can also share a comment uh, at during the entire program. We will be having uh, polls from time to time. I look forward to your participation on these polls. Next. We have with us uh, Tim Smith, our global trade credit practice leader for Marsh. Tyler, who is in charge for the trade credit practice business for the Asia region. And Akshay Bhadwaj, our India leader. Next. We will be covering the trade credit insurance, the supply chain disruption, the geopolitical risk, uh, the trade credit finance, how it's impacted during the COVID times, and of course, uh, a question answers. And before looking at that, we look at the future of all these risks as well. Next. Marsh and McLennan uh, has been proudly associated with the World Economic Forum uh, in bringing out numerous uh, risk reports and various other reports. We have been doing a report called Global Risk Report every year for the World Economic Forum in partnership with a few other firms. And the 2021 uh, Global Risk Report, uh, the risk map on the likelihood and impact has some very interesting observations which we will be touching upon during our webinar. One is the issue of uh, the risk of uh, the debt crisis the risk of the asset bubble burst and the price instability. As you would have, we all know, while we are in the middle of pandemic, when major risks strike businesses in the country and the global economy, we have seen in the past as well in 2008, uh, this, the amount of liquidity which is spurned by the central bank uh, helps manage the immediate liquidity risk and potential bankruptcy risks but it unleashes a different form of other challenges in the form of the rising debt levels, which are unprecedented. And we have seen the asset bubble prices, whether in terms of uh, the stock market, the commodity prices, and there's always a risk whether these prices are away from the real economy and the real market. But we are in very interesting times, completely uncharted territory, and all of them do have their impact on the risks and the solutions we'll be deliberating today on the credit, on the geopolitical and other areas. So I'm looking forward to this session. We have an opportunity to raise as many questions and comments and we have a very, very uh, learned panel with global, regional and India experience. So with this, I hand over to my colleague, Akshay, who leads the India practice for this business. Akshay, over to you. Yeah. 
<clears throat> Thank you, Sanjay. Uh, I think the best way to start would be with a poll question. So, uh, Riladri, if you can just put in the poll, please. I request everybody to uh, please vote. It uh, sets the tone, gives us an insight of what's going on with the participants' thought. Yeah, thank, thank you, Niladri. I think on this part, I can say confidently that uh, the house is on the same side where we believe that the risk what we foresee with respect to debt crisis, prolonged stagnation, asset bubble burst, price instability, and I think fifty-five percent of the house is in the is in the same is on the same uh, uh, ground with debt crisis and prolonged. Economic stagnation is something which worries everyone. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, I'll start with my uh, first slide here. Uh, this is uh, March Global Credit Specialties uh, at your disposal. As, I, as, uh, as you're aware, we are 850 colleagues uh, spread across uh, 50, uh, 57 countries, uh, no 50 plus languages with an average experience of 14.5 years and focusing on eight business development areas. And I think there's nothing which is under credit credit uh, uh, embed, which March does not offer. But what it means to our clients is that you have a partner who's the biggest producer of the business by your side, advising, placing, servicing your risk uh, with the widest reach to ensure that we are able to serve you across the world, wherever you want, in whatever business language you want us to be serving you. And by sheer size, what we mean uh, is that we can dominate the discourse of uh, insurers and ensure that every client of Marsh uh, is heard at the highest echelon of the insurers. Coming to the next slide, this is our team in India. Uh, we are 10 people strong, which makes us one of the largest team in India, handling about 200 odd relationships. Uh, as you can see in India, we service all four lines of business that is straight credit, political structure, finance and surety is a separate desk. We have a claims desk and ops desk. The whole idea, I think about four years back, we started this as a desk uh, because we believe that we are in the business of serving or uh, delivering on an insurer's promise. And when my client needs me the most, we should be at their disposal and there should be a separate desk whose job is to ensure that 24 by seven, they are serving our claims, our client's claims. The best part about having a claims desk, which I realized is that, uh, whatever our learnings are from each and every claim is then looped back to the commercial teams to ensure that our clients get the best of the policy wordings and probability of a doubted or disputed or claimed concerns are alienated upfront. Rather being reactive, we intend to be proactive. This is just a small slide on basic fundamentals. Many of you might be knowing trade credit insurance is what uh, is, I, I, I do not call it as an indemnity product. It's, a, it's more of a risk management solution, which ensures that when you sell your goods on credit and you are exposed to the risk of insolvency, risk of protracted default by the buyer or political risk that is taken care by this program. Now, the reason why we call it a solution is simply because it is not about indemnity, but it helps you find the right buyers, which are solvent and strong help you benchmark the right credit exposure on individual buyers, which is again a free of cost, but it gives you an insight as to how much exposure you should take on a buyer, helps you with recovery and even take care of uh, legal expenses when the buyer fails to pay, you have got your indemnity and you have to go legal. I think in terms of solution, it's, it's, it's a fantastic solution which walks side by side, helping you In terms of product, since we have a claim desk and the claim desk is not only assisting India, but also Asia, I've done a small analysis and you can see the number of claims what we have seen from India have been pretty high, uh, towering much higher than any of our peers in Asia. Uh, what, now what if, if I can probably say that 
currently we have about 167 live claims worth about 14 million or about 103 crores. Uh, we consider it as an opportunity to serve our clients. So we have 167 live opportunities where we are delivering. Uh, in last uh, six, seven years, since we have started working seriously on the claim part of credit credit in India, we have uh, proudly served about 1,170 odd claims worth about 84 million USD and Indian amount 614 odd crores, including India's largest claim uh, recently paid uh, worth about $3 million. Uh, there are two aspects to it, which I want to highlight here. One, in the pandemic period, we have seen about 60% hike in the number of claims which have been paid, sorry, uh, which have been uh, filed with the uh, various insurers, vis-a-vis pre-pandemic period. So yes, the threat is real, uh, the risk is real. Uh, and second is that claims are being paid, claims are being filed, claims are being paid. I think we should be thankful, insurers have been supportive and we have been able to serve our clients. The biggest claims what we have seen are coming from IT, ICT, ITS sector, textile, chemical, manufacturing, consumer retail, and white and brown goods. And as we move in the course of the presentation, you'll be able to relate uh, how, how these claims are uh, treated and why these claims came in. Now, coming to the topic of supply chain disruption, uh, before I go in, I would request Niladri if you can run. Uh, there are two poll questions which Niladri will take you through. And can we please start the poll? To what extent were your supply chain operations were impacted due to COVID? No impact, medium impact, high impact, total shutdown, but later picked up. Thank you, we are getting good responses. The lines are changing. Thank you. Uh, about 48% of the respondents have said that there have been a medium impact. So yes, there was an impact. 25% uh, have seen high impact. 18% saw a total shutdown, which later picked up. And I can definitely correlate to it. 10% uh, of the people say no impact. And I think that's that's something which we should be thankful. About 90% house uh, goes towards minor or medium to total shutdown impact. Uh, next poll, uh, Niladri. How would you define your supply chain management plan before and during COVID uh, period? This is very interesting. Actually, it came from one of our clients as well. Uh, one is we had a robust supply chain management plan and business continuity plan resulting in zero disruption. We, we believed that we had a robust plan, but COVID arrived. We, however, were able to manage and our supply chain completely crippled and impacted business. Thank you. Uh, the results are in front of us. 88% believe that they had a robust plan. Then COVID arrived. We were, however, able to manage. I know this is the story which is there with everyone. This is an unprecedented event, and uh, I, I can uh, I, I can only say that whoever we have interacted, I think this is similar thought everybody shares with you. Now, having said that, uh, if we talk about our uh, just a sec, I think. Sorry. These are the most impacted. Now, if you see this slide, these are the most impacted uh, industries, automobile, life sciences, healthcare, electronics, hospitality, aviation, retail, uh, organized retail, and the top supply chain disruptors, what I understand, uh, have been factory fires and disruption. We have seen huge amount of business interruption losses because many companies were just shut because of COVID. Uh, probably protocols were not followed or uh, they didn't have time to follow the protocols. There have been a lot of mergers and acquisition. Uh, there had been unpredictable sales pattern because of demand and supply shock. Uh, countries have moved towards protecting. Almost 100 odd countries put up one or the other type of trade barriers to protect their domestic industry. Access to capital became very, very tough. And the new work order was there. Now, just to give you a perspective, I was going through a report of Resilink Corporation, which is a very big supply chain management uh, company. What they say is, and this is very important to know, that the factory fires were up by almost 150% from pre-COVID period. There have been 5,000 plus SOS calls by their clients for supply chain disruption. 
and almost 50% of it were war room discussion. Supply shortage of critical components and packaging material went up to almost as high as 638%. In addition to it, we saw many ports being shut down, containers, uh, container requirement going through the roof, resulting in a complete chaos for a very, very long period of time. Now, if I go to the next slide, you will see the disruption in the sectors. And I think this is something which I just shared where you can see the disruption, the most important thing, and this is what correlates to our uh, uh, survey, is that businesses came down to the lowest inventory to sell in past 20 years, which is phenomenal, unprecedented, and pretty scary. So this was our first topic. I would move to Tim, actually, with his global experience. Tim, uh, if I can have you, my first question is with you. What do you think in options? Uh, what is what are your experiences with respect to how the companies uh, address these challenges, and what our clients over here can learn from those experiences? Thank Tim? you, thank you, Bakshay. Yeah, supply chain is uh, definitely a key concern now for most businesses, and what is absolutely assured is the post COVID pandemic world is definitely going to look a lot different than it did two years ago. Um, I was very interested. I made some notes actually around the polls that you were doing uh, actually on the first uh, question, 10% of the uh, companies attending saw no impact on their supply chain, whilst 18% saw potentially a total closure. And that is that is pretty much what we're seeing um, in, in, in a global basis. We're, we're seeing between sort of one in uh, uh, eight and one in five companies telling us that they've had severe restructuring, severe slowdown, and in certain instances, uh, temporary closures due to supply chain issues. Um, it, 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 when, when the global economy closed down, I think there were vulnerabilities in uh, supply chains experienced everywhere. Um, people that had previously gone to uh, countries for low cost solutions of, of supply chain or raw materials were suddenly hampered by the fact they could not get those goods to the end user. And uh, that has created a, a huge level of storm. And that's not uh, related to India in any shape or form. It is a truly global concept and, and issue. I think some of the pressures companies are going to look at going forward will be how do they combat supply chain? And a part of that might be growing your own resource locally, um, trying to eliminate the dependence on um, key areas that are perceived going forward as potentially risky. Um, it, it almost flies. We, we were in a pre-COVID world of a just-in-time um, sort of replacement, delivery, whatever, whatever. I think companies are now going to look at um, trying to hold on to uh, some level of stock uh, all the way through the supply chain, whether it be raw materials through to um, uh, uh, goods that are partially worked on right the way through to, to end, end uses. You mentioned before about the uh, pharmaceutical sector, and we know that there's some extraordinary shortages in the pharmaceutical sector. And part of that relates to uh, obviously what's going on with the pandemic. Um, but but I, I think we need to expect that that supply chain will go beyond individual uh, uh, industry sectors and it will become a global phenomenon. I, I think, as I said, the challenge will be how to make your supply chain resilient while still remaining competitive. We all know that some things are not going to change. I genuinely don't believe any consumer either on this call or beyond this call are actually going to agree to pay higher cost for any goods simply because they're made in their own country. Um, also, we've got to be aware that political uh, influence will start to uh, come in as well, where countries start to look at make America great again, make India great again, make the UK great again, all of all of those things. There will be definitely political pressure to ensure that you buy locally. But what won't what won't be a factor is is me or anyone else saying, I'll pay 20% more for those same goods that I, I bought two, two, two years ago. So yeah, the, the supply chain disruption is, is universal. I, I think it's gonna be a real problem. And I think companies will have to find local solutions 
to 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 those steps along the way and and as i say i think probably compartmentalizing the overall raw material to end good uh, structure and uh, and finding a route around closing down some of those uh, some of those delays yeah thank you tim i i believe i i fully agree with you i think uh, there is a requirement which i can i think my clients must have uh, the our clients must have learned it, that there is a requirement to compartmentalize elongate make supply chain uh, more flexible have more uh, uh, steps and overall the economy the the global economy how the things are changing are from globalization what was the key word earlier today it is more about economic nationalism which is taking the route across the world uh, uh, tyler uh, what has been your observation in asia and maybe you can throw some light what our clients can learn from it sure thanks uh, thanks actually and thanks uh, hello everyone um, I mean, just following on some of the the, the points that Tim was making, uh, and then make it more towards a little bit more towards Asia. Um, one of the the key sectors that that we've seen, it's been in the headlines a lot. I know we're touching upon it later on. Is really semiconductors. Um, uh, an interesting couple of statistics that that I've seen recently. So Nissan is going to manufacture five hundred thousand uh, less vehicles in 2021 than previously planned due to the shortage of uh, semiconductor chips. And the CEO of Intel recently said that it's going to take one to two years to make up the shortfall that they're now seeing in, the, in this industry. And obviously semiconductors go into all sorts of products ranging from mobile phones to cars. Um, so it affects a, a lot of people in different facets of life. Um, but no, to, I mean, here in Asia, uh, Tim sort of touched upon it as well. It's interesting that a lot of manufacturing, um, even pre-COVID, was moving towards uh, more cheaper manufacturing bases. Um, uh, a key highlight of that really was Vietnam. Someone like Vietnam, they picked up a lot of manufacturing bases in the last two years or so. And I think that will continue to flow out of, out of China into, into less uh, or uh, more low paying um, countries at this at this moment in time. So I think you'll start to see that. Um, it, you know, there has been that threat under President Trump before previously, and Tim sort of alluded to this also, in that there, there might be a shift to move some of that manufacturing base back to those countries. I, something personally I didn't believe will happen. It, it's more of a um, playing to the political base and it, it's popular at the time. I think really from a practical sense, it's something that probably won't happen. Um, going forward, so you will see manufacturing bases, I think, not only in China, but also moving to other parts of Asia as well. Yeah. Um, so I think Asia does really hold the key from a, from a manufacturing point of view and it is, re is integral to the whole supply chain uh, issue I, moving forward. Yeah, I think on supply chain, the, what, the buzzword which I'm listening uh, from our clients is that people are working on China plus one type of uh, philosophy where you cannot have uh, all your eggs in one basket. Rather, people are, as Tim was saying, it is uh, getting diverse. But I think quite an insight uh, on uh, the disruption and what could be the learning for our client. One is obviously making it more flexible and stagnated. Uh, and second is obviously looking at more options rather than having all eggs in one basket. Uh, with this, uh, I'll move to uh, my uh, next slide, uh, basically on uh, uh, the most important aspect. I think uh, this is something which needs to be told is on the domino effect. Uh, uh, it's not related to only one, one aspect. So before I move on, uh, uh, can I request uh, Niladri to run a small poll and I'll just request uh, people to participate in it. Uh, in your opinion, which sector among the following was most unaffected? Please note, I'm asking about most unaffected uh, uh, in, in, in this whole uh, uh, humdrum, yeah. But thank you. Uh, I think this was something which was expected, but 72% uh, people say that uh, hospitals and healthcare was least affected. But just to give you a statistics, uh, US alone saw 42 hospital chains uh, going insolvent, uh, resulting into a loss of almost uh, 200 million. So uh, the the purpose of this question uh, was, it's, it's the more to assign that uh, it's not about what we see from our naked eye. The impacts of these type of pandemics is, for real and uh, it affects 
many sectors which are not probably visible where we do not go uh, uh, with our perception, but the impact have been on them as well. And the second question is uh, with respect to semiconductor, which Tyler just said, uh, in the nutshell, what is your broad estimate with respect to the amount of loss with just automobile industry suffered because of semiconductor chip uh, shortage? Thank you. Uh, last nine more seconds. Yes. Okay. Uh, while 34% uh, people say 80 to 90 billion USD, I think 21% people have got it right. It is more than 100 or 100 to 110 billion USD. That is the amount of loss which has been suffered only by the automobile industry purely because of shortage of uh, 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 chips. And so as I move uh, to the next slide, uh, where I talk about domino effect of SEM. And here I've put in certain statistics, uh, which you can read through, talks about high of uh, insolvencies because of COVID between 20 to 21% to 35%, which is from Eulahamis and uh, Atreides. Uh, two out of three countries will post strong rise in insolvencies, uh, notably US, Brazil, China, uh, Spain, Italy. Uh, there have been 20% hike in bankruptcies with non-essential retailers. In India itself, 300 odd companies were declared in the, uh, installment, of which 120 were later withdrawn. Uh, initially, uh, and when we talk about domino effect, I want to highlight this aspect. When the first wave came, the experts were talking about a V-shaped recovery. When the second wave came, people were talking about U-shaped recovery. And every time we try to stabilize ourselves and make a positive comment, uh, there is something new. So now we have not get heard from anyone what type of recovery it would be. Uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, what I intend to speak uh, two or three points over here is that <clears throat> one is I think after World War II, this is the first time that the whole world is in the same boat. Second, what we are looking and what we indeed need to insist upon and what insurers are also asking, it's not about KYC now, which was earlier the rule that, okay, we should focus on our customer, but it has moved to KYCC, where they are saying that you should know about your customer's customer and the macroeconomic environment which they are operating in. Now with this, I just want to uh, invite Tyler for his views. Uh, how do you, how are you seeing this uh, domino effect in supply chain management? Uh, what are the experiences of our clients in Asia and uh, how they have coped with it and probably something which our clients can learn from your understanding of this. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Akshay. Um, so, of course, my role is all look across Asia and it, it's very interesting during this time because to a degree we're seeing two different parts of the region. Um, in North Asia, in certain in certain countries, China being the obvious example, they were the first to to really fully come out of the the pandemic um, to a degree. Although there's been some um, increased cases in the in sort of intervening nine months or so, um, but during that time, you saw an increase in in GDP, a recovery. Retail sector recovered very rapidly as well, and overall, uh, there's quite a positive outlook uh, for China, and the growth levels are in the region of about six and a half to, to seven percent for 2021. Um, now that contrasts uh, very starkly to, I would say, Southeast Asia, where um, there have been, the countries there have been going in and out of lockdown for most of 2021. Um, so Singapore is just coming out of its latest lockdown, restrictions are easing, but there's been a, a sharp increase in the number of cases in Indonesia and Thailand in particular in the last three to four weeks, and, and that will continue. Um, so that's really impacted the recovery, um, especially when you look at certain industries like retail, for example. Um, so I, I think towards the end of last year, economists were much more uh, optimistic about the overall chances of recovery, the increases in GDP, uh, you know, in its entirety throughout Asia, uh, because Asia had been so badly impacted in, in 2020. However, the recovery has certainly been staged and will continue to be staged throughout the rest of 2021. Um, however, I think uh, Southeast Asia will have a, a more um, positive 
impact and more positive recovery in in 2020, uh, 2022 going forward. We can just be hopeful, um, I believe. <laughs> yes, I think so. Yeah, it's yeah. really it's really based on the rollout of vaccines yep. as well. So you've seen in certain countries where, um, for various reasons, the vaccine rollout in, in the Philippines, for example, it's been very slow in Indonesia, Thailand. Um, however, in other countries, it has been has been like Singapore is a good example of that. Um, I know the prime minister there was saying that he wanted to get to the 70% mark um, by National Day, which was earlier in August, and that they were actually close to that uh, close to that mark. And I think the recovery now moving forward in Singapore will be will be much more gradual. Um, so recoveries overall um, uh, actually have been it's been very um, uh, inconsistent and i think throughout 2021 the rest of 2021 we're going to see that and obviously that's had an impact on the various industries our clients yeah. are in thanks thanks Shadar. uh tim i just wanted to uh, check with you on this uh, do you think that there is a larger domino effect on uh, every aspect of of business uh, not just what we see one second is uh, our insist our insurers actually insisting not only on uh, know your customer but also on kycc as well as the macroeconomic and uh, other factors when underwriting risk or advising our clients and something of that sort. Yeah, yes. I mean, I mean firstly, I agree totally with what Tyler just said. Uh, I mean, as the, as the rollout of the vaccine becomes more apparent, so that particular country appears economically to be able to uh, either withstand more or react more positively to that. So I, I, I totally agree with that. And, and that is not again uh, held to Asia. It is a global phenomenon, and, and and that is definitely happening at the moment. The other thing that that strikes me around the domino effect is we should not underestimate. It might be the smallest component, but it can stop as as Tyler and you have suggested the whole delivery of a a finished good. So semiconductor uh, stalling or, or supply chain difficulties will stop. The production of 500,000 cars or, or, or whatever. And I saw the, 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 the last poll around the how many millions of dollars is this going to impact the business for. That's not sustainable. The, the, the motor industry cannot afford to, to, to sustain losses of 80, 90, 100 million dollars a year. That, that's, that's not a sustainable industry. So yes, I, I, I think uh, the domino effect is very apparent. I, I think it is appearing more quickly in those countries that have struggled in those regions that have struggled to get the, uh, the vaccine out. And I think we will see that particularly in places like Latin America. I think sadly in parts of Africa, uh, there are definitely some real issues that will be, uh, that will be uh, more prevalent as we go towards the end of this year. And then coming to your question on the uh, underwriters and what they see and how they view the macro economics. I, I think this slide up here um, uh, um, says it all, really. Um, there is a prediction of increasing uh, losses. There is a prediction of increasing insolvencies. And there is a prediction that actually um, uh, uh, that businesses across all industry sectors will be harmed. I, I no longer feel that this will be an individual one or two industry sector, one or two countries. I do think this is really a global business and I, I, a, a global issue. And I think from an economic perspective, we, we, we have to expect that um, uh, buyers and sellers will all be impacted through this process. And as I, as I said, from a small potential uh, uh, particle of, of, of an end product, uh, that could cease, stop, and kill some very, very large companies. I think we do have some of that to, to, to Correct. come through. Correct. Well, uh, one very important uh, point which I picked up, Tim, is about uh, the level of vaccination. I think if the vaccination levels improve, the economic condition improves. So when a client is looking at his portfolio, he's not. he should only not be looking at the clients or his clients. But uh, when we talk about macroeconomic environment, if he knows that the vaccination levels are high, probably what type of strategy they have, he will know that, okay, this economy is going to be better and probably that's a safer bet than probably countries with lower vaccination rates, which can have maybe impact of Delta or maybe other variants of it. So, uh, yeah, yeah, thank you for this, Tim. I think that was pretty insightful. I will move to my next topic, and I think this is something which I would need your uh, insights probably that can help. Uh, geopolitical risk and supply chain management. Niladi, do we have any poll for this or uh, we move to the content? 
we have a poll later. Yeah, please, if you can, maybe just. Uh, sorry. We have a poll in the next section. Okay, okay sorry. Uh, uh, these are some information which I picked up uh, from uh, various sources like Global Peace Index says that there have been a 244% rise in right general strikes and anti-government demonstration during this period. More than 100 countries have launched export and FDI restrictions. This is, I think, first time in last five decades that one fifth of the portfolio of top three rating agencies have been downgraded in terms of uh, sovereigns, which has made it very difficult for them to raise debt. Uh, since start of this epidemic, and I think we saw it in India as well, uh, almost 84 million people have been displaced, which resulted into uh, joblessness, shortage of labor, hunger, stress on government uh, 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 coffers, because you require more of uh, social uh, security, then probably investing in other source. Uh, I think this is something which is very pertinent. Now, I, I'll just ask Tim once again to maybe help us. How How is he seeing this global shift? How geopolitical risk uh, is important for a, a client when he's looking at his portfolio? So we have discussed about dominoes effect. Obviously, uh, there is vaccination and other things. But when it comes to geopolitical risk, events like recently we have seen Taliban uh, capturing Afghanistan or something of that sort, how do they impact or what should be our client's philosophy when they're looking at uh, the, the, when designing or looking at their portfolio, looking at their supply chain management, how should they manage it? Uh, Tim? Yeah, I mean, actually you, you mentioned about Afghanistan and, and um it's very difficult to respond to that question without making a political statement. But genuinely, I don't think there's anybody who's looking at the pictures uh, on the, the TV news that, that the heart does not go out to the, the poor people of Afghanistan, having had 21 years of internal turmoil and then to um, end up in the position they're in is, uh, is uh, unbelievably heartbreaking. So, so I, I think you, you start from that position. From, from a business perspective and changing to the uh, political uh, issues around Afghanistan, not many individual countries actually trade in, into Afghanistan. And therefore, I, I think the, the risk from a trade credit perspective, uh, a loss perspective and a potential insolvency uh, uh, perspective is minimal of, of, of Afghanistan in itself. However, if you then broaden the question to more what about the geopolitical situation of the world at the moment with general strikes and the, uh, as you say, the anti-government uh, riots, et cetera, that are, that are going on throughout the world? Um, this is not bespoke to, to Afghanistan. It is bespoke to every single large country, those that manufacture, those that don't, those are service-led, those that are, are business-led. It, it, it is a global issue. And um, there is definitely uh, an, an undercurrent of unrest in, in a number of key raw material supplying countries. And, and that will be uh, an element of, of issue for all companies going forward. And I think it, it reverts back through to your uh, original question around supply chain and, and compartment, compartmentalization. You, you have to understand and agree at which parts are the most uh, difficult or risky for your business and try to find an alternate solution. And if that alternate solution is not available, then, then, then actually working with those people in as um, harmonious and uh, collegiate method as possible. Um, but I, 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 I fear that irrespective of whether the government uh, believes they're doing the right thing around COVID, um, the enhancement and support given to businesses in general from most governments has been um, unprecedented. Um, we have seen numbers of laws being changed. We've seen numbers of financial uh, and non-financial support from, from governments, from grants, from furloughs, from, from all, all sorts of, of parts. And all that is to try to keep the heartbeat of the global uh, 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 trade uh, 
uh, ongoing. And, and in, in part, I, I certainly believe that has been particularly successful in the past 18 months. But as we get to the stage where people are becoming uh, more comfortable, they are you know, vaccinated and, and the world does start to reopen, undoubtedly, there will be questions and there will be riots about what could have been done better. Why did you turn left and not right and, and, and whatever. And, and some of those will absolutely dive deep down into businesses and they will displace businesses and there will be a new uh, a rule of engagement and whatever you want to call it, there will be changes there. So for me, the geopolitical risk is, is all encompassing. And, and I think that the fact that the, the, you, you have the statistic there, that demonstrations have increased by over 200%. I don't see that stopping. I, I, I think there are more and more uh, ongoing issues. And, and, and the best I think we can advise is certainly from a, a supply chain basis to, to, to look for those, uh, those, those countries and companies with integrity to work with those as much as possible to find a solution. Okay. If you have a key supplier, your China plus one is exactly right. And in fact, it's probably China plus one plus two plus three. It's having those alternatives. <laughs> it's making sure that you are uh, enabling your own business to uh, uh, step away from some of those former methodologies, which will no longer be acceptable either to the consumer. I think they will pay. They will. They will uh, uh, look at it with the dollars they spend. Uh, right the way through to 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 the governments. Correct. Now, thanks, Tim. Uh, Tyler, uh, any short comment from your side? Uh, I think what uh, Tim suggested, suggested uh, it's it's like actually KYCC, and I, I think thank you for this. We people are talking about China plus one, but actually they should be talking about China plus one plus two plus three plus four. Uh, that is the best strategy to ensure that supply chain is intact, and and God forbid something of this sort it comes again or something of this sort is elongated, uh, the business is not affected. Uh, Tyler, uh, any comment from your side? Some short comment and then we move to the next slide. Yeah, no, yeah. no problem actually. I mean, I completely agree with, with Tim's comments, which are all, all completely uh, spot on. Um, the way that the government's reacted uh, during the GFC 2008, 2009, that was more of a reactive approach. Um, but during the crisis in 2020, uh, the governments there were very, very, uh, proactive as Tim mentioned um, you've just seen in the US in the last couple of months really you've had the the stimulus package for 1.9 trillion dollars and then you've got uh, the Biden uh, infrastructure package of 1.2 trillion dollars that's there to really stimulate the economy but also to enforce and, and rebuild the dilapidated infrastructure of the US whether it be airports bridges roads uh, the, the uh, railway infrastructure that is, is so far behind the likes of Japan for example um, these are all really unprecedented schemes that we're seeing in place. And there's vast amounts of liquidity uh, globally in the world that it's really masked over the problems that a lot of buyers have had. Um, so these buyers that were financially crippled and uh, were really impacted negatively pre-COVID, it just helped to really mask and cover over that on a temporary basis. And you're mm -hmm. going to see those companies and those buyers will start to have and start to show financial cracks um, going forward, whether it's in Q4 of this year or the first half of 2022. And that's something that our clients and a number of the, 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 um, the attendees here today will really have to be on guard for um, because there is a sense, and we've seen that um, globally, but here in Asia as well, the number of claims and past dues that are coming in to the credit insurance markets now, and really for the last nine months or so, have been historic lows. We're in a very benign environment now that that will not last whatsoever it's not going to last it's it's we're going to see it take off as you mentioned a couple of slides ago in terms of the the corporate insolvency levels will increase quite rapidly either in q4 or the first half of 2022 yeah no thank you Tyler. i would want you to stay i would run uh two more slides and i actually want your comments because this is related to what you're saying with respect to ecs supporting sure. and uh then maybe i'll have uh comments from tim uh Basically, this is the uh, uh, same thing which I was talking about, geopolitical risk and the same. Uh, 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 Nadri, can we have a small poll here, please? Yeah. Uh, due to COVID, uh, we experienced a restrictive banking approach. What have been our experience of your organization? Uh, just wanted to have your feedback. 
uh, from our clients as to whether it has been increased uh, increase of corporate capital, whether banks are asking for higher collateral, a higher security for application, uh, or all of the above. I believe the house goes with all of the above. I, I, I fully can understand because what we have seen, and this uh, takes me to my next slide, which uh, talks about what we are seeing in terms of challenges. Uh, the global trade, uh, merchandise trade is approximately about 18 to 19 trillion is what I understand. And 10 or 11% shortage talks about almost $2 trillion of trade, which has got restricted. What we are also seeing is that the banks have uh, become pretty expensive, creating a sort of a FUD choke because banks were asked to not uh, charge interest or give holidays, which resulted into they force, they not doing new financing while companies required funds to extend more credit and pass through this whole process. So there was a sort of a fund choke. Uh, what is interesting is that this is a US uh, statistic which says that 60% of the applications were rejected because many people uh, sought trade credit when the fire was already on. Uh, and another thing was with respect to 64% of ECS, export credit agencies had taken immense amount of measures to boost the working capital of the uh, uh, people and this is the slide what we are observing where the exporters are being supported by sovereign or sovereign backed ECA. There have been cases of reinsurance and top ups by ECA in certain countries. There have been uh, situations where extended timelines were given to file claims. A uh, lot of work was done. Now, still what I have observed or what we have observed on ground is that the benefit may have reached certain companies it has not reached many companies and uh, i just wanted to understand so this is more what we understand sitting in india i would want to tyler uh, if you can give throw some light on what has been your asia expense experience and uh, shortly and then maybe i can focus on tim if he can provide insights on what has been the global experience on this sure thanks uh, thanks actually so yeah in, in regards to eca is mainly in, in asia uh, they've obviously been very supportive uh, of their respective countries to try and push export trade um, globally. Uh, we've seen it across industries in particular. Um, and uh, the, the claims levels, again, the claims in the past years haven't really been there. Um, I think it's something or somewhere where it, it could um, actually revert back to them a little bit negatively um, in the beginning of 2022 as, as defaults start to come in. Um, and they will write cover on markets, more high risk markets that some of the private uh, insurers are a little bit more hesitant to do, uh, say, some in, in Latin America or even in Eastern Europe, for example. Um, but we have seen them obviously supporting supporting the exporters there. Um, however, in certain trade sectors, those exports haven't been at the same levels that they were one, two or even three years ago uh, before. Uh, that's not true in, in certain markets like uh, ICT, for example, and telecoms. We've seen those increase significantly. Um, however, in other industries that have been impacted by shortfalls or shortfalls in requests, uh, that those um, amounts of sales that have been going through those policies have actually reduced down as well. Um, but the ECAs overall, they've been very supportive during this time frame. Yeah, thank you, Alan. Uh, Tim, uh, just a quick one from you. Uh, I remember last uh, presentation when we did, uh, when webinar we did, we, talk, we talked about economic zombies. I think the situation is yet not improved. Uh, the situation still remains uh, the same way. And I think our clients should be aware when uh, they are talking or when they are uh, dealing with the new companies uh, to be very sure about where they stand financially. Yes, I, I, I mentioned it in, the, in answering the, uh, the last question. There were a number of laws that were changed by governments across the world which uh, in, in, in some regions made it almost illegal for a company to be called insolvent. And, and historically, had they traded in those methodologies, the directors would have been struck off and, and put in prison. So, so yes, it is now, uh, as the world starts to become more normal, there will be a number of these zombie companies that had historically been allowed to trade through COVID who may or may not meet the criteria going forward. So I think there is genuinely a need to be certain that you do know your customers and that you recognize 
um, a, a company that has traded for the past 18 months in a difficult situation is not necessarily trading solvently. That, that, that definitely is the first point. The second part I just want to mention on, on, on trade finance, just to come back on a couple of things that Tyler also raised, we have seen an extraordinary increase in inquiries for trade credit insurance supported by trade finance. And it is all about finance. It is all about supporting or finding additional working capital to cover all of the issues you've been, you've been talking about in this past hour, to cover supply chain changes, to cover developments, to cover uh, logistic costs, all, all of these things are being affected. So, so I, I would say now, probably on a global basis, three out of every five inquiries we get globally from Marsh Trade Credit uh, has a trade finance angle attached to the inquiry. Um, the, the one part I'm, I'm slightly skeptical about, and it was on the slide before actually, was the fact that 60% of inquiries are being uh, rejected. I think that you, you do have to put some uh, uh, quantitative of information around that because yeah. a number of people through the pandemic have had serious concentrations and therefore come to market Sorry. with single risks. They've come to market with uh, uh, customers that are already uh, in, in, in a difficult place and also coming to the market at the most difficult time of trade credit insurance 120 years history. So, so I, I think within those parameters, 60% reject rejection is still not fantastic by any shape, but it is, yeah. it is not as, as bad or poor as it thinks. I, I would also confirm from a global perspective, Marsh has around six and a half to 7,000 clients. I believe I could count on one hand those clients that were rejected renewal terms by insurers. Um, so, so if you already had the product, the insurance product stood with you, maybe in a slightly lesser form with slightly lesser cover with maybe some changes of terms, but I could count on one hand how many global clients insurers walked away from. If, however, you were new to market and you had already got a problem of, of deficient payments or whatever, but you wanted insurance cover, undoubtedly the, the, the underwriting markets were in a conservative perspective. So I fully agree with you, Tim. Yeah, I fully agree with you. In India, we also saw a lot of people who were the first time buyers. They just came with some random risk to be covered. And obviously, in these times when the insurers are restrictive, those applications do get rejected. So I think that's a that's more of that phenomena. Since it came from Wall Street General specific to US, we thought it should be shared that this is how the situation looks like. And uh, I think uh, thank you for this insight, uh, Tim. Uh, what? Uh, Akshay. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, Akshay, to to interrupt, uh, interject. I was just going to say. Yeah. Um, to, to add on to one of Tim's points, I think it's really important here in Asia last year, and I think, as Tim mentioned, it's a pretty much a global um, trend as well. Uh, we didn't lose any accounts last year to, to self-insurance at all. Um, all, of the, all of the clients that we had continued with credit insurance because they saw the value in the product and uh, they saw that the, the carriers responded. They maintained the coverage for the most part. There are very few reductions or cancellations of risks in industries that were greatly impacted, obviously, like uh, the airline industry, tourism industry, for example, we don't have many clients in, in those sectors anyway. Um, but overall, they maintain coverage uh, across the board and some uh, where they have enormous amounts of exposure, like some automotive and ICT, which are two of their most heavily insured globally. And I was chatting to you to uh, the leading um, credit insurer here in, in APAC the other day, and he said that their strategy in the next nine years is to double uh, the gross written premiums that they're underwriting at this time. So they see this region as in here in Asia Pacific as their key gross market globally, and they'll continue to invest here as they grow. Uh, thank you, Tyler. Tyler uh, I think with this, we come to the last question and the last topic of our uh, this fantastic discussion. We have seven more minutes. Uh, are we out of the woods now? I think this is the question what we have. Uh, this is one slide uh, I've not spent time, but what we are seeing is that since uh, COVID started in Jan, Feb uh, 2020, what we are listening is only positivity. But as I said, new variants keep coming in, lockdowns keep extending, vaccine is a challenge. And I believe that there is a source of a false sense of safety which is being pushed to us. And that bring that brought us to do some sort of an analysis uh, with 2008 global financial crisis. What I understand is that that time probably global trade was about 70 trillion and the contraction was about 0.4% uh, resulting in 
lot of companies, but still it was restrictive. Today, we uh, in, in, in GenFab, probably we would have been about $100 trillion global economy. And what we understand is that the contraction is more than 4%, which means about $4 trillion going in thin air. So I just wanted to understand the regional and the global perspective of are we out of the woods yet? Uh, Tim, uh, any thoughts? When do you think that this thing is going to be over? How uh, how it is going to be over? What would be the new world order? I think this is the most important aspect. We have five minutes. I'd like, like to take both of your views. Uh, in the meantime, team is addressing question and answers. And I request anybody who have any queries, please uh, put it in the Q&A box. Yeah, uh, Tim. So, so a very quick uh, two minute answer. Um, are, yeah. are we out of the woods yet? Absolutely not. Um, do I, 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 I see further uh, uh, worsening before it gets better? Possibly, but that will be regional. It won't be on a global basis. We've already seen some economies have started a real robust fight back and that will continue. Uh, supply chain is key and therefore uh, those countries that are having issues already will uh, we will need to find a resolution to those or the local alternate will come through. Um, do I think that um, uh, there is a knock on effect? Yes, absolutely. When do I think it will get back to normal? I, I don't think there will be normal. I, I, I think there will be probably uh, COVID will be with us certainly for the rest of my lifetime. It may well be that you have an annual jab to sort of keep keep up. But I think there will be restrictions at certain times of 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 the world, uh, or oh, sorry, certain restrictions of, of the world for for a number of years to come. Uh, uh, you look at Singapore and 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 Hong Kong and India and the UK. There are all restrictions there at the moment. I believe we will get a little lighter. I think those people that are jabbed and 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 proficient will be allowed to travel more than others. I think we will have a a, a, yep. a dual speed recovery. Those those countries that are. Uh, uh, working well will actually with 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 the pandemic. Sorry, I think will will grow quicker. But I but I also think that there will be certain pinpoints where Australia will close itself down again, or Singapore will say we're no longer going to have people whilst we have this. I think there will be spikes. So I don't think we'll go back to the old normal um, certainly for a, a number of years to come. I think we will find a way of doing business. We'll find a way to travel again. We'll find yeah. a way of interacting. We'll find a way to beat the supply chain issues, but I, I think there will be some very tentative uh, uh, reviews, and I do not believe this will be a V or a U-shaped recovery uh, unless the U is fairly elongated. Uh, for, for, for me, I, I think we have to expect that um, at different times, uh, different parts of the world will be experiencing different things, and and as we get smarter at rolling with this COVID. And as we get smarter at reacting to it, so we might be able to predict those in the future, but certainly um, not at the moment, I'm afraid. No, thank you, Tim. I think even I'm missing traveling. Uh, it has been really long, and I know it would have been very difficult for you. Uh, <laughs> Tyler, uh, any quick comments, and then we move to question and answers from uh, Tyler. Sure, thanks. Thanks, actually. I mean, Tim's made some very good points there. Uh, um, I think the, the vast majority of which I agree, agree with. So completely agree, nowhere near being out of the woods yet at all. Um, I, I think what's really going to be really interesting is you know, how, how developments take place in the likes of the UK and the US, which are pretty much fully open now. People are traveling around, people are going on holiday. Um, you look at the Premiership uh, football league season that started nearly two weeks ago packed stadiums I looked at the crowd there were probably one or two people wearing masks throughout the stadium um, so it's, it's just going to be interesting to see how uh, now the trends go up um, whether they do go up in terms of the number of cases that are being reported the number of deaths um, but I think what's really going to impact is the number of hospital hospitalizations um, because I think if if cases go up that's fine and it's mild uh, but if hospitalizations go up and these are more longer term that's going to have more of a detrimental impact there um, but that's it really going to show you the way, I think, in, in the UK and other parts of Europe and the US, um, for, for Asia in particular, because you have a look at the likes of Hong Kong, the likes of Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, who are looking at a zero case um, outlook and uh, uh, regulations to move forward, which I think most people would agree. It, it, it's not, it's really not practical to do that um, from a 
economical perspective, from a humanitarian perspective, you can't have that sort of outlook. It's, it's not going to work at all. I mean, so I th so I think you know you have to look to the, the UK, Europe, uh, the US to see if that experiment works out. I don't think those countries are going to go into hard lockdown again. I I, d I just don't think um, uh, the populations there will actually accept it for another autumn, for another winter. Um, so I think they're going to really work with what they have and work through it. As Tim mentioned, there'll be booster jabs, uh, which are being rolled out in the US at this time and will soon be rolled out elsewhere as well. It's really about the vaccination levels and how those can be built up over time and in a short period of time, especially here in Asia, where in some countries the rates are very, very low still. If you get that, if you get to herd immunity, then you can open up the economies and then you can start to look to, to open up to travel more and Remember. it's going to take time it's not going to happen yes. it's not going to get back to normal in 2022 maybe sometime later in 2023 we'll get back to some closer to being how it was before but again not to the degree that we had it before so i think we've got to I'll be used to probably, the normal yeah. as it is i'll i'll probably give it to tim because he said okay uh, i'm not even saying year probably three five years so we don't know how things are going to be. Uh, with this, I open the panel for uh, Q&A. I know we have overshot by about eight, nine minutes. Uh, we'll be very happy to have questions from our panelists, uh, sorry, from our uh, participants. Uh, please feel free uh, if, if you have any specific uh, questions. Tyler, would you like to take questions uh, from... Uh, one of the questions which is unanswered. I would like to thank the panelists for my, for my question is from a small buyer's angle. We see a challenge from insurers in covering buyers who are proprietors, LLCs, non-incorporate entities. Underwriters stress insist on getting financial, which in India is a challenge, how it is being tackled globally and regionally. Getting financials yeah. in current time is very difficult, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really good question and very topical as well. So I, I think what we've seen more of and what we push, push more on the carriers to do is to base it on uh, trading experience up to a certain level. Insurers won't give discretionary limits um, up to, say, five or ten million dollars, of course. However, they will give reasonable size discretionary limits. And that then enables the, our policyholders, our clients, just to provide coverage to SME level um, uh, type figures based on the prior trading experience. And if you've had good trading experience during COVID and during the current times, which have been very turbulent, um, that's obviously a positive and it shows you're very good at collecting collecting outstanding debts uh, within a certain period of time. So, you know, I think if we place more emphasis and we, we push, as in Marsh, push for our clients to get more coverage based on, on positive trading experience, that can only help. And especially if, if it's in a trade sector that is, I would say, not greatly impacted by COVID. So if it's um, to do with the hospitality sector, um, restaurant sector, it's going to be more challenging. But if it's ICT, pharmaceutical, chemical, uh, then I think we'll have more success in that regard. Thank you. I have a question from uh, Vedya Nathanji. Uh, he says, though we are comparing with US, UK and all, uh, what can we expect? Uh, what can we expect of India business? Sir, would you want to uh, come online and maybe ask the question more in detail? We can just unmute you if you can just ask the question. No, I'm just checking. I uh, hope I'm audible. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, yes, we can hear I was you. Just checking, I was just checking what 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 can we expect uh, the kind of business we, uh, that we can experience in in India uh, for the coming uh, months or years. What is your view view on this? Being um, non yeah, from underwriting perspective? Yeah, right. From underwriting perspective, I, I think um, underwriters are starting to uh, relook at India. Um, you've obviously had some local uh, regulatory issues over, over many years around uh, banks and, and, and credit insurance, and that, that, that somewhat hampered uh, insurers' investment into India for, for a number of years. That has uh, obviously recently begun to change, and... and, and of the three largest insurers, we know at least two of them are looking to uh, look to begin to reinvest in India over the coming months. So I think from an Indian perspective, at the moment, it may still be BAU, but I think there are smarter methods to, to try to approach the markets. And certainly Tyler 
spoke about a couple of them uh, just now for the smaller uh, enterprises. And, and, and we are working with insurers around raising the profile uh, of business in India um, and the, the record and the positiveness around the growth. Um, and we are pushing underwriters to invest still further to, um, to try to build uh, from their current position. So, so although that may not be an answer for tomorrow, and it may not even be an answer for next month, it, it is certainly something where insurers are reviewing and reviewing positively their, their, their investment strategies here. Okay, thank you. Uh, sh uh, there's a question from, uh, uh, which says that, uh, and I think Tim Tyler, you can address it. How has been TC premium and capacity trends over the last one and a half years? Uh, what are your insights on how the market and what market is saying from insurance, uh, credit insurance perspective? So, so, so in terms, yeah, I was going to say just from Asia in particular, and, and this I think relates to, to certainly to India as well. Um, I think premium rates, the trend is um, because we're in such a, a benign claims period and, and past due reporting um, timeframe at the moment in the industry uh, globally, but also here in Asia, um, that premium rates are very competitive and they're, they're quite low, um, probably some of the lowest that I've seen recently. Um, and that's really been off the back of an increase in rates that occurred during 2020 when insurers were forecasting a real uh, tsunami of claims that were going to, they, they projected to be coming in and didn't materialize because of all the government subsidies that we touched upon earlier during, during this uh, webinar. Um, so I think that that will change. I think now is really a good time. If you, you don't purchase credit insurance at this time. Now is really an ideal time to look at the product and to look at pricing because it is competitive. And uh, we feel as though that competitive uh, trend won't really last into, into next year as the claims in the past years are probably forecast to increase with insolvencies increasing as well. So now's a really good time. In terms of coverage, insurers are back to the pre-COVID levels that they had um, before in January 2020. Uh, they will continue to, to look to increase their coverage across sectors as well. Sectors that they feel still find challenging, um, that they're going to have trouble to increase uh, to increase those exposure levels uh, that they had pre-COVID, but in ones where there's been a real increase um, during the COVID period, ICT being the really obvious one, that's where they have looked to increase their coverage as sales have increased, buyers have become more profitable, et cetera. Uh, thank you, Tyler. Uh, I think uh, uh, after Tim's comment, uh, because I'm already being told that we have overshot by seven minutes, so we'll have, uh, we'll close by 5.10. Uh, anybody who has query can obviously reach out to us. Uh, Tim, last comment from you before we close down. I, I was just going to say, um, uh, just to just to add to, to some hard facts to Tyler's uh, comments. From a capacity level, last year uh, underwriters reduced the three largest global underwriters reduced their capacity and exposure levels between nine and eleven percent individually. Um, they are now rewriting far more levels of cover than they had been before, but they're still not yet up to the levels. Of, uh, of actual exposure totals that they had prior to that. Um, so so uh, we have seen a reduction, but it is building back quite quickly. Um, for me, uh, just to say to everyone who attended, thank you. Thank you to you, Akshay, and your team, uh, obviously, and Tyler as well, for, for participating to Sanjay, for allowing Tyler and myself to come through. I, I think these are genuinely very beneficial. Hopefully, you found some of our comments helpful and supportive. I know the Marsh team in India are, are very keen to help support both existing and, and potential future clients in this uh, avenue. And if Tyler can support or I can support in any way, then I'm sure we'd be happy to. So to you, actually, thank you and, uh, and Sanjay. For thank you, Tim. Uh, thank you, Tyler, uh, for your support. And uh, I would want to thank all our clients uh, who took out time uh, uh, just before, uh, uh, in, in a busy day between four to five. Thank you for joining in. I hope you enjoyed the session. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everybody.